Hello and welcome to Matt and Mike Paul Focus. I'm Mike. And I'm not. And today we're going to be joined by Kat Hamilton, all the way from the United States of America, who will be speaking to us about the 2006 Guillermo del Toro film Pan's Labyrinth. Uh, firstly, Kat, thank you very much for joining us here today uh, via Skype. Uh, Matt described your job as an editor, but I'm pretty sure he's undersold you. Um, <laughs> may I ask, like, how, how would you describe what you do in the industry? Oh, sure. And uh, thanks so much for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a lead assistant editor, um, which essentially means that I do a lot of the technical behind the scenes stuff in post-production and run a, a team of people who support that. Um, so I do the media management. I receive the footage from the field. I build the projects. I manage the projects um, and, and keep everything running smoothly, getting everything from the offline edit to online and mix and uh, to tech specs to deliver to broadcast network. That's great. Can you can you um, describe quickly what um, the difference between online and offline editing? Because I heard a description recently, sure. but I wasn't quite sure. Maybe you can uh, help explain it to me. Yeah, essentially raw footage as it comes in is just too big for most computers to handle, especially when there's network connection and there's multiple editors and producers working with that footage and it has to be shared across the network. So when you start the offline edit projects, you're essentially doing all the, the story um, editing. And we bring in that, that footage converted at a lower res so that the, you know, everything can kind of work. And essentially in order to go into the online process that all has to be relinked to the original media and uh, transcoded to a higher resolution that's, you know, to broadcast spec. And then in the online process, the online editor does the coloring. I like to describe coloring as you know if you've ever been on one of those really old airplanes and you see all of the screens going down the rows and they're all a slightly different color you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. some of them are kind of green some of them are kind of pink and cameras are like that as well so especially on multi-camera shoots there's a little bit of a tinge of difference in the color and so part of coloring is color matching and then there's also color that's done creatively in order to i mean like usually um say documentaries meant for kids are usually brighter and more saturated and that's a creative decision and grittier things can be a little undersaturated or you know the blacks can be a little bit blacker so there's there's that going on as well and they rebuild effects or sometimes there's effects done in the offline that are kind of placeholders and the online will make that pretty and look good um, and then the final mix um, is an audio mixer will we'll go through and and make that sound as good as possible um, so it's it's all the sort of finishing touches uh, before it, it gets delivered to network. And in terms of your um, input, are you basically overseeing the entire edit process, or is it just the sort of the, the first stages of getting the footage in and getting it organized? Yeah, the first stages are um, getting it in and organized, and you know taking care of the projects and doing tech support throughout, and then also you know various requests, um, you know creating outputs. Um, pulling footage for promo that the networks will use to, to make their sort of adverts and things about the programs um, and a number of other things, uh, you know, finding sound effects or sometimes um, helping editors in various ways. Uh, and then there's the rolling process of getting that those episodes relinked to the high res media and delivering it online and uh, QCing episodes for technical errors um, and things like that, um, and then doing all the final project backups. You know, like when you you sit down and you start a project, everything has obviously been storyboarded, it's been uh, scripted, you know, it's been scene numbered, everything like that. But I assume from the very beginning of editing, you have a director, or you know, is there is there a kind of um, uh, would it be the director of the movie or of the TV program who comes in and, and decides where the edit should go? Or is there a different person who supervises that, who makes the creative decisions? Yeah, I couldn't speak from experience about scripted film and television because I work in non-scripted documentary, reality, um, docuseries, that sort of thing. Um, but usually what happens is as, as soon as things get to post, you have story producers and the story producers do string outs, which are essentially um, sort of assemblies. And they hand that over to an editor to polish, put music on, build sound effects, 
put effects on and, and build the story. And the first line of defense creatively is that those cuts, those scenes will go to an executive producer or a showrunner and they'll give notes and then those notes are applied. Uh, then the rough cut will go to network. The network executive producers will send back notes. Those notes will be applied again, viewed by the showrunner and sent back as a, you know, the next kind of cut uh, to the network until they've, they've decided on, on picture lock. Um, and even then there's, there's often little changes made at the end or even when it's in the online, um, Sometimes creatively, because the executive producer suddenly goes, "Oh, I, I want a different shot there," or like, "Oh, I don't like." I was going to say, is there ever any the like awkward push and pull going on? Is there ever that kind of auto thing where it's like, you know, you have someone who is like completely it has the opposite vision to someone else, and there's a lot of, you know, is there, is there ever any ever any drama, or is it usually quite oh. clinical? Always, always. <laughs> no, there's yeah. there's tons of drama, you know. And the the classic conundrum is is when the network comes back with a note that directly. Um, is completely against what the executive producer or showrunner at the production company um, wants. Okay. And then sometimes there's negotiations. Sometimes the you know showrunner will get on with, with the network and they'll hash it out um, and make a de decision. A lot of the time, you know, when you think about network TV, the, the network has, um, you know, the production company has the network as a client. Um, and at the end of the day, you, you kind of need to make the client happy. Um, and they're the ones who cut the checks. So you, you want to keep them happy. Um, but then, of course, there's the pride of, of the showrunner and it's it's their baby. So um, so sometimes there is pushback. Um, and then, uh, you know, I've also seen it where somebody goes, OK, your idea sucks, but we'll do it. And then the network will sometimes be like, yeah, you were right. <laughs> That was a bad idea. <laughs> I was going to say, are you just sat in the middle, just looking awkward, like all the way during these conversations, just like, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. There's, there is, there is some of that. You know, sometimes I get in trouble because I like to get a little too involved. Um, which you know, sometimes people like and sometimes people are are not not into. But um, that's sort of like, oh, I have a suggestion <laughs> in the yeah. corner. Like, shut up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. and the longer yeah. the longer I've been in the career, the more bold I've I've gotten. You know, a lot of the time, if you think that something would work, um, you know, if you actually make a copy of a sequence and you start cutting it and you hand it to the showrunner and be like, "What do you think of this?" Sometimes they'll be like, "Oh, that's great. That definitely you know fixes that problem." Um, you know, and it's, it's been fun now to see more and more of, of my edits actually make TV. Oh yeah. Um, that must and, be so satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and, and I get involved a lot, um, when we're in the online and there's a problem because sometimes in the low resolution footage, you can't see certain things that become problematic later for either continuity or for clearance issues. Um, and so, and also we have a thing in, in the UK, they called it, they call it lip flapping. In America, we call it gold fishing. So somebody in the background of a shot, you know, their, their mouth is, is opening and closing, but there are no words coming out. Mm. Um, and sometimes you didn't notice them in the, in the low resolution version. And sometimes you have to recut certain bits of, of scenes in order to, to hide it, or you need to find their mic and put it in if it makes sense to put it in. But there's so many cheats when it comes to trying to build documentary stories that um, you know, people get really bold <laughs> with with their with their choices to try so, and make things work. It's so, so something like you know, on Game of Thrones, the famous gaff where you had the McDonald's, or was it the Starbucks cup Starbucks in the Starbucks shop? Cup, yeah. Do you believe that that was that was a, a mistake, or do you think that that had to be deliberate? I mean, do you think mistakes can be made like that? It's hard to imagine. I mean, thing is, is that you know, when there's a lot of people who QC these episodes. And sometimes I'll be watching TV and I'll see something and be like, how did nobody catch that? But I also manage the notes for the online screeners um, when they have when they do the color and they do the final effects, they'll they'll send out screeners for notes. And it's interesting to see the list of notes from from people, you know, three or four different people uh, who catch completely different things. Um, and one thing that's really difficult about QCing is that if you get too into the story, you're not paying attention to all the tiny details. Of course, and there's things yeah. like if it's really you know, good, you know, you're actually watching the drama. You're not actually, you know, paying yeah. attention. I can imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. Recently, you know, I was I was telling an editor that um, his scene was my favorite that was cut for the the series I was just working on. And when I watched it back, it was the one that I missed the most QC like notes for. <laughs> um, 
And, you know, one thing that we look out for a lot is uh, called blanking when there's a black line on top, bottom or, or sides when somebody's done a resize and haven't shifted it over so that it's full framed or sometimes it can be in camera or a, a transcode error or something like that. And that can be really hard to see. Um, you know, so when you're watching QCing, you're, you're looking for these tiny details. Um, and if you're paying too much attention to what's actually going on, it's, it's very easy to miss, you know, the, the brain and the eyes work together very closely. And, uh, you know, the brain is very good at ignoring things when it's focused on, on yeah. something particular. I, I can imagine, especially if you've got like a movie like Nightcrawler or something, you know, that's all set at night and you, like you said about <laughs> the black hard. bars, it's all black, isn't it? So I guess you'd yeah. have to maybe have the, I don't know, the brightness way up so you could spot the borders. I don't know how you would do that, but, um, but that's, uh, that, that's really cool. I nev I'd never thought of those things. As like yeah, you'd have to same. watch out for. That's fascinating. It's, it's yeah. kind of weird, like, wanting to be on a boring project so you can do your job better. <laughs> <rather than laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Boring programs are always really well edited and uh, really clean. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I am, um, you know, it's funny because I, I often don't enjoy my work as much if, if things aren't going terribly wrong because I like the puzzle that goes into it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, like, it, it makes things uh, a lot more interesting, but not too wrong, you know, just enough wrong so I can come in and like save the day and look like a superhero for a second. Usually yeah, covering some of my own mistakes, but I, I suppose if it's going too well, there's no challenge to it, really, isn't it? Because you've yeah. done it. I'm guessing by this point, you've done it so much that you know if things don't do go by the numbers, it doesn't feel like you've really worked. Yeah, I'd probably say that you know I've I've probably have about you know 40 TV shows I've worked on at this point. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of notches in that belt. <laughs> at university in St Andrews with my uh, with my brother and obviously a few people that I know uh, friends of friends of, of, of his as well and uh, I ended up doing the sound and the music for the project that you that you did the body suspension documentary that was called Hooked um, yeah that's was that right the, was that the first film that you made or had you made anything like what, what was your sort of practical introduction to filmmaking you know when did you first pick up a camera yeah I first picked up a camera actually in high school um, and I, I was lucky to go to, to a private high school in, in L.A. and they have, um, you know, a film course that you can take uh, for all four years. And, um, you know, my initial interest in filmmaking came from uh, watching Lord of the Rings, actually. Yeah, um, I do not blame you at all. Yeah, that's a good, <laughs> pretty good intro, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I bought the, the DVD um the, when it came out and I just remember watching it so many times and then it being like, I can't watch this anymore. So I have to watch all of the special features. So it was, it was watching all the behind the scenes stuff that got me really interested in, in actually making movies. And, yeah. um, and I, I really wanted to be a screenwriter at, at one point. Um, but then it was one project I had in high school where my initial project kind of fell through because um, this was a do an assignment to do a documentary. And I was like, I don't want to do documentary. I want to make movies, you know. And um, my initial project uh, became ruined because we were shooting on mini DV at the time. And I, I oh, wasn't I remember those, the, yeah. <laughs> I remember yeah. those very well. Same, yeah. And I wasn't taking <laughs> care fun. of the mini DVs very well. And uh, they got destroyed. And I was absolutely distraught. And then I was like, wait a second. Like, I had started playing Magic the Gathering. And I'm, I'm coming off as such a nerd right now. But um, and I and I just remembered thinking, oh, this is such an interesting community. These people who come from totally different walks of life, who would never meet each other, who come to this one shop to to play this game. And I was like, I want to make a film about this. Um, and then I fell in love with the process. Uh, I loved it so much. Um I think what's amazing about it is like you start out with a plan and you can't really know where it's going. You can try and control it as, as much as you can, but there's only so much control you you have over real events. And then you really write the story in the in the edit. And what was fascinating about that to me was like, oh, this is kind of like how we create meaning out of our own lives. You know, you get all of this footage, all of this information, and then you decide which bits are important and which, you know, mean something to you. And then that becomes sort of our life narrative. And I was like, this is just a, a mirror of, of how people make meaning. And 
Uh, and from that day forward, it's, it's all I wanted to do. That's really a very philosophical way to look at it. I never really thought of it like that. But I suppose <laughs> I think that's one of the things that when I first started making films or being uh, around filmmaking, you know, watching other people make films was just how much trial and error there was, you know, in terms of like, you know, I assume that the roll camera, the person says the line once and then they cut and that's that, you know, it's done. You know, but it's like, the you know, there's so many projects that I've worked on where there's been, you know, 26, 27 takes and so much you know, stuff on the cutting room floor, so to speak. Uh, and that was that was what really, really kind of surprised me was, first of all, how much waiting around there was and doing nothing, but also, yeah. you know, how much... Cause when you're a kid and you've got a camera, it's all go, isn't it? It's just like filming constantly and stuff. But, you know, when you're doing it, uh, you know, more, um, you know, professionally, if you like, or you're trying to be more professional, there's, there's just so much kind of like chaff there, you know, that you get from that's never, ever going to be used. And uh, yeah. that was that was really shocking to me and sort of surprising because I didn't expect that. Yeah, and I think I but the other thing I love about the process is just how hugely collaborative it is. Mm. You know, if you've ever actually sat through the credits on on a film, you know there are so many people who are involved in supporting the project. And yeah, absolutely. Um, and I I kind of love that there's so much money and such a huge industry for it that that people obviously value stories. And uh, that gives me some hope for humanity. I wonder when, like, the first, I don't know if you guys remember a moment where you realized that films were actually made by human beings. <laughs> I kind of, I, I, you know, when I think about being a kid and watching something like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, there was never any point where I thought a human made this. I thought it just kind of existed. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? It was a documentary <laughs> about New York. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think about the, you know, like you say, the behind the scenes, because I think that was something that wasn't as commonly explored back then, or at least, you know, commonly mm. displayed. I think some of the first instances are things like the making of Thriller, you know, and stuff like that. That was one of the first, and that, oh, that was the early 80s. But, you know, there were, there were few instances like that where you really saw behind the scenes. But generally speaking, especially as a kid, like you just saw the movie and you just kind of took it on face value, didn't you? You just thought this is just was, a yeah. thing that exists, you know. Like, it, was a, it was Toy Story for me. Toy Story. When I, when I first saw Toy Story in the cinema, I was like, "That's what I want to do. I, I want to make films like that." So really? I, I wanted to be like a three D animator for like the longest time wow. when I was a kid. That's pretty early on then that you realised that there were actually people making these things. Well, yeah, because like uh, I think they had my my parents had to try and like stop me from thinking my toys were alive by <laughs> shattering the illusion just by like people made this mic don't yeah. worry this you know people in america made this film and i was like oh okay i want to do that then so yeah that was God, the first and talk movie. about oh, talk about a collaborative process i mean for, uh, you know as far as like animation is concerned especially with um pixar i mean i i went to the pixar studio um several years ago now um, and and got a personal tour, which was very very cool because they don't wow. they don't do tours. Wow. Um, but we had at St Andrews, I was on the um, like basically in the film filmmaking society, and we had a um, national film festival every year. And somebody managed to get in touch with Pixar, and paid for two Pixar animators to come over and be um, the judge for this like Scottish film festival. We, we went to the screening and we, we had a drink with them afterwards, didn't we? And like, yeah, they were just the nicest exactly. people in the world. Just I think they, absolutely they were, lovely. They, they were, I think they were uh, photographing Brave. They were doing concept art or research for Brave. Yeah, they I were. They were doing correctly. yeah research for Brave, um, which uh, yeah was was so cool to to like. And they they and they of course you know loved the idea of coming to Scotland. But then they managed to like I don't know if they're still doing it, but you know a couple of years after we're still sending sending Pixar animators you know um, two of them each each year. Uh, which was very cool, but um, and those those ones that we'd met and um, had had that drink with, I stayed in contact with, and then when I went up to Northern California, I got in touch and was like, "Hey, can I can I come see Pixar?" <laughs> that just shows <laughs> and that actually like, these things worked. seem so out of reach, but you know, if you don't ask, you don't get. And also, the, they were just really really nice people, weren't they? So yeah, I'm not surprised, but yeah, what I mean, uh, briefly, what was what was that like? I remember they they had a, a kitchen that had like every kind of cereal you could imagine and. A a fridge that had I've every kind of, of yeah. milk you could imagine just <laughs> just full of different kinds of milk it was wild but um the thing that i found most interesting is learning that um each of the animators is assigned a three second scene uh not even a scene but three seconds of a scene mm. and it goes through a few different processes so you have the animator who does like the very basic shapes in the beginning and then um, once they're finished with that they hand it off to another person who starts adding a little bit more detail and flair. 
And then a third person who, you know, has like all of the the details um, that go into it and and kind of polish it off. Um, and that's just three seconds that you're yeah. watching. <laughs> so it's truly a collaborative uh, process then, isn't it? I mean, in terms of like, if you're doing three seconds at a time and it's all a different team doing each, you know, moment or literally moment of it, yeah. then yeah. it's truly collaborative, isn't it? And it's almost amazing that it becomes, you know, cohesive at, at some point. Yeah. Um, and I love learning what animators do to kind of study motion. Um, I, I worked briefly at uh, Mole Richardson, I don't know if you've heard of it, but they're one of the biggest suppliers of lights for Hollywood. It was it was very, very cool. Um, it was when I first got back to L.A. after after grad school and I um, I volunteered there for a while. Um, they had cinematographers that would that would come through from like huge names, which was amazing. Um, but we also got um, students from local universities who were who were film students to give lighting demonstrations. And then also Disney animators came in. And uh, at the time I was volunteering there, they were doing research for Frozen. And wow. <laughs> one of the things that we did was get big ice blocks and snow and just do different lighting on them and like crush the snow under different kinds of light. Um, so the animators could like be sketching away to, to kind of see what what light does on on ice and snow you know later when it came out it was just cool to be like yeah i showed them how to put light on on those things that snow yeah. looks great because of me yeah exactly. right and to be fair in frozen the snow and the ice does look great so yeah well yeah. done well, yeah done. you would hope so i was gonna Cheers say that, but the, the evolution has now got to the point where like uh in seoul recently i just watched it and i was like oh we've reached the pinnacle there's no way that could be any better Oh, God, it was amazing, yeah. When, when he steps into the jazz club and he's hearing the singer sing for the first time and it was just so photorealistic, I was just like, that, that's yeah, that's it now. We can't get any better. And you are obviously helpful <laughs> in the evolution of that. <laughs> with the snow. Yeah, I'll there, take all the you? credit. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I was floored by some of the photorealism in that, in that movie. I just, you know, every new scene, I was just like, wait, that has to be real. But, yeah, you yeah. know, because because the backgrounds of it are are wild and it's it's almost alarming because it makes me think that, you know, we will eventually have, you know, entire entire movies that are supposed to look like they're absolutely real with all sorts of dead actors. And yeah, yeah, you know. exactly. The whole sort of bring back two pack, uh, bring yeah. two back back to life. Like Peter Cushing yeah. and Rogue One. And, yeah. Before we um, move swiftly on to Pan's Labyrinth, your movie of choice, um, I, I, you know, I mean, to me, you're you're incredibly successful you worked so hard so you're completely deserving of your success and congratulations oh thank you where do you go from here i mean what what is there, is there any you know I, I imagine in the job that you're doing at the moment you have li very little time for for filmmaking independently or do you actually get to still pick up a camera or is that even something you want to do anymore you know i recently um picked up a camera again and started a project um which i'm i'm pretty excited about um my sort of weekend thing is doing partner acrobatics and I've gotten really interested in um, basically backstory packages. Um, backstory packages have always been my, my favorite element in series. Usually this is when, for example, if you're watching Dancing with the Stars and they present a contestant and then you kind of see what their home life is like and you learn a bit about them. And, um, you know, they do this a lot in docuseries to kind of, we we um, we call that like a sob story, wouldn't we? A sob you know, story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when it yeah. when it goes to their home, like and it shows, the you know, what, they have a bit of a, you know, yeah. they've had Pop a bit of bad luck yeah. in their life, that kind yeah. of thing. That's yeah. what we they do call it. frequently <laughs> latch on to to the stories with a little bit more drama. Yeah. Um, but I just I love the way it creates an empathetic connection between the audience and this person they've just seen who they didn't care about three minutes ago, but after this two to three minute long backstory package then um they are able to like go on and have the audience root for them and and want them to that, that's to not easy to do either i mean that's for. the thing like you know people kind of sometimes take them a bit for granted but to draw that kind of emotional pull is that's not 
automatic. You know, that's something yeah. that you make, have to, you know, like you said, you have to do your job well in order yeah. to, you know, make, make that. Make um, a sympathetic character in yeah. two minutes or like yeah. exactly. one, make someone seem sympathetic. Like that's really hard to and do. It's, <laughs> and it's amazing because they don't tend to be more than about two and a half minutes long. And and sometimes, you know, like on American Ninja Warrior, it's it's like a minute and a half that they give or 45 yeah. seconds. Like it's it's wildly short to to give these these people a reason for you to care about them. Um, but that's something you'd want to direct yourself and you'd want to go out there and actually, you know, uh, yeah. head that up. I mean, on a on a practical level, um, they frequently send a very small crew to, to do those. And especially with the stage shows, I know in the UK they call those VTs because it's, it's what, you know, stands for videotape, um, which is based on the archaic term of having sort of a videotape to pre-play um, on mm. the studio stage when it's like, oh, let's go to the tape and see that thing. Yeah, uh, very, very it's, it's, 80s, uh, 70s, 80s vibe. Yeah, yeah. I was going to yeah, say, exactly. for the kids <laughs> listening, videotape was before yeah. DVDs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had to tell my son, Luca, what a phone box is today. Oh, He's three. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, was, that was interesting. Yeah, but anyway, sorry, but, carry on. <laughs> but in the UK, they, they, they don't call them packages. They call them VTs. Um, so uh, they even in non-stage shows now, they, they would call it a, a backstory VT. But... Um, yeah, on a practical level, it's it's a very small crew that that goes and 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 does this. And so I was thinking that I could do backstory packages on their own. You know, does you don't need the rest of the story necessarily. You know, especially with um, people in the acrobatic community, a lot of people have seen their stuff on Instagram and have been doing their sequences, and they don't know much about the people who created those sequences or. Um, how that sequence was was conceived, and um, and hoping to open it up a little bit more to because uh, it's a niche thing, so it'd be it'd be cool to open it up so that um, it's easy for anyone to to watch it and kind of get what's going on. Um, but it's something I've started working on, and no end date in sight currently. Um, but eventually, it'll be probably a YouTube channel. It'll be um, a series of short web docs. Um, and, and yeah, if, if I find that I'm, I'm good at it, then it might be something I'll, I'll try and, and pursue professionally, but it'd be very different from, from what I'm, I'm doing now. And there's a couple of things I've, I've thought about doing within post-production, but sometimes you get a chance to do something you've wanted to do for a very long time and you realize it's really not for you. <laughs> yeah. That's the ultimate thing is there's no when to know when to not pursue something. You know, I think yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't have to pursue things, you know, if you really find out it's not for you, just just leave it. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's very easy to fall into that sunk cost fallacy, you yes. know, um, because I wanted to edit for, for so long and um and that's what I was aiming towards and I was spending hours outside of, of work that were limited just, you know, practicing or um, shadowing editors and then I got a chance to start editing and I was like oh my god I hate this um, yeah. <laughs> as as a professional I professionally hate this but then you're um, like I hate it so it's worth doing so I, I, if I have to be miserable for it to be worthwhile <laughs> like you know just a, just two more years of misery and it'll be worth it you know that kind of thing <laughs> yeah and I had I had a bit of a crisis and then went back to to the drawing board but I think what's great about working in TV and doing freelance is that um, each project is so different. Each company is so different um, that, you know, I have a new job every six or seven months. Sometimes I do short term work and um, it's constantly changing. So um, I'm, I'm rarely ever, ever bored. I, I had a weird moment like a, a year ago when I was um, I was editing um, two podcasts um, and two short films. And uh, and I and I was sort of thinking in my head, God, I want to be a sound editor one day, you know, like one day, just one day. If I keep going, I'll be a sound. I was like, not counting what you're like, actually I'm doing. I'm doing it now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, you know, it was like kind of thing. It was like you know, but you know, I think I yeah, my, my thing was always kind of like one day I'll be doing that, you know, one day. And I, I mean, it took me a while to realize that I was already doing it, and I was really happy with what I was doing, you know. Yeah. So I sort of I think that's that thing of just you know, I'm being 
I'm trying out just being happy in my lot and just doing what makes me happy rather than thinking, one, I have to be miserable if I'm doing something worthwhile and two, you know, one day I'll do that. You know what I mean? One day I'll be yeah. able to do that because I'm just like, you know, I'm... Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I mean, that's... I'm, I'm, I'm talking to, an, you know, a, a very successful American editor and one of my best friends, you know, here on microphones, which I'm about to edit, you know, so it's like, you know. And that's something I've been thinking about um, a lot recently is uh, I think it's there's a very American attitude of um, more is better and, um, you know, never enough. And I think that's a way to be really, really miserable. That's just to mm. just a way to seal the deal and guarantee your misery. Um, and I think you know, a lot of I people think... find it out too late as well. I think that I'm only just beginning to sort of realize, you know, to discover it. And I think that some people might find out even later, which is kind of sad, you know. I'm not saying I've got or all the answers never. or anything, but, you know, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's definitely a healthier way to live. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that um, there's a lot of people who are afraid that if they're happy with what they have now, it makes them unambitious and it means that they'll yeah. never achieve what they what they want to achieve. But I think there is a lot in the idea that it's not about having what you want, but it's about wanting what you already have Bingo. And, and appreciating <laughs> that, you know, and and somebody once told me uh, this is vaguely related, but somebody once told me that you're professional as soon as you want to be. And, and that was a big, um, you know, light on for me because I realized that, um, you know, you don't need to set standards for yourself to say, well, when I reach this, then I'll be professional or if just this has to happen in order for me to do X, Y, and Z. And you don't need that. Um, you no, know, as no. soon as you want to be, you, you are, you can be, it's, it's just a choice. Yeah, absolutely, dude. Like, so, saying that, um, I am a bit nervous about editing this video now that we're talking <laughs> to a professional editor. Yeah, yeah, because Mike, uh, I do the audio edit and then Mike sort of builds a video, a video around it. Yeah. So, and Mike's uh, job, I will admit, is a lot harder than mine, especially in the <laughs> yeah. podcasting world. So, uh, but don't worry, man. I'm sure Cat will be happy. Oh, to yeah, I'm not nervous it. at all. Yeah, of course. It's going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, maybe Cat could cover this one if we just yeah, we'll send you the, exactly. Uh, the we'll pay you. Don't you worry. can do this one. Cat you will do you won't like my rate. <laughs> oh, <laughs> true. <laughs> But it'll be our most successful and most, most professional episode to date, so that's fine. Dollars or pounds. Uh. <laughs> uh, so the film you decided to talk about today is Guillermo del Toro's uh, twisted fairy tale, uh, Pan's Labyrinth, uh, another amazing director that uh, we're finally getting to talk about, and arguably, I believe, his greatest film. Would you agree with that? I would say yes. I mean, I haven't seen all of his films, so maybe I'm jumping the gun there, but yeah, it's my favorite. It's a favorite of the ones you've seen so far, though. That's good. Yeah, that's right. After rewatching it uh, last night, I think I'm 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 going to agree with that. I, I really <laughs> yeah. think it yeah. is. Um, I uh, I haven't seen Kronos. I've seen Devil's Backbone, which oh. I really really liked, and one scene in particular, which I'll uh, I'll reference to later. But we um, we haven't seen that one. We just oh, discussed this in oh, the, okay. in the break, true. but we yeah. haven't seen Devil's right. Backbone. So okay, please don't spoil. I won't. I won't. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, it's it's very very good. It's it's brilliant. Uh, Pan's Labyrinth was was fantastic when I saw it. It took me to see things like Pacific Rim and you know I, I, I and I'll be honest I've never really liked the Hellboy movies oh, like they just a shame do it for me I like them personally um, <laughs> I tried to re uh, Mike lent them to me on DVD on Blu-ray recently and I rewatched them and they just didn't just didn't get it it That's just fair. didn't work for me the, the design and the creature design and all the effects and everything are wonderful like, and the performances but yeah just not for me That's cool Yeah I don't think there's anyone with um better character design right now as far as like auteurs go Yeah definitely um you know, I feel like everybody talked about Tim Burton for a long time and and his designs, but he sort of knocked him nothing. off the top spot, nothing. didn't he? Like, yeah, I think I think he's the sort of naughty's Burton, really, in a way. I, I, with Burton, I feel like it's very much variation on a theme. But with Guillermo del Toro, you just never know. It's just one man's imagination, yeah. and he's going to do whatever kind of freaks him out, and that's going to yeah. be freaking you out as well. Like and when you when you God compare, God is the, he good the, at it? The, yeah, he but is. like you compare like the ghosts of like Devil's Backbone, or because um, I mean I've seen I've seen stills. Yeah, you've seen the yeah <laughs> um, yeah you know you know the aesthetic of exactly. it. exactly, yeah. and like the the kind of spirits in the Hellboy films. But then compared to Crimson Peak, where everything's very much more gothic and realistic and mm. very very grim and grimy and yeah it just he, he runs the gamut from like short to tall and when when he was going to be um linked to the hobbit films instead of uh, peter jackson doing oh that, I, was I was so excited exactly, about that i was so excited oh, to yeah. see what kind of like creatures from middle earth he would have 
uh, come up with. I, I heard a podcast so. recently where he said that he literally moved to New Zealand as well. You know, he moved his family there he and they were so like set up pre-production. Wow. And I don't know really? exactly what happened and he wouldn't say. Yeah. But he basically said, yeah, after two years, I just went home. I was yeah. just like, screw this. So... I mean, I, I would have loved to have seen those films if it was if he'd done two as well. If he just stuck to two movies yeah. and made them Del Toro esque, that would have been fascinating. And that's the thing when you hear Del Toro's name is is connected to a project, you're just like, this is going to be visually cool. Like, yeah. like I want to see what the creatures are going to be like. Like, that's yeah. I think the the biggest excitement that kind of comes out of it. Del Toro executive produced one of my other favorite films, which is El Orfanato or The Orphanage. Um, which, you know, I'm not a huge fan of horror films normally, but, uh, this one is just so good and so powerful and it feels meaningful, which I love. You know, I don't, I don't like when there's kind of no point to, to something is just to terrify you and make you Especially in horror, yeah. I think it really has to um, be about something because like a lot of films like, you know, Jaws, for example, it, it's got a shark in it, but it's not really about the shark. It's not you know, it's, never it's about like, the shark. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I, is the orphanage the one with the little girl who turns out to not be a little girl, but she turns out to be like... That's orphan. Oh, that's again. orphan, right, okay. <laughs> so I've not actually seen the orphanage. Can you guys just give me a little rundown? Take a week out if you'd like. Um, so a woman brings her family back to her childhood home, which, um, is an orphanage that's, that's now been abandoned and her own son is adopted, but doesn't know that he's adopted. Um, and there start to be some kind of creepy happenings around, around the orphanage. Um, and you find out that all of the kids that grew up with her, but weren't adopted, um, you know, before her that were still there, um, that something happened to them. And um, I think my favorite thing from that from that film, and I'm sure Mike, you'll you'll remember this, is uh, there's a game that they play and they kind of string it throughout the entire film. And it's yeah. so fucking creepy and it's so good when it's first introduced. <laughs> You know, like when when movies start, especially horror movies, there's this like the calm before the storm. And so everything has a different light to it. And uh, the game is um, toca la pared, which means like uh, knock on the wall or touch the wall. Um, oh, and so the idea yes, is that, yes. yeah, somebody is facing a wall and and uh, knocks on the wall three times and then turns around. And there are, you know, the other p- players are able to move closer to you. Um, when your back is turned. Oh, is it like, uh, what's that called? Footsteps. Grandmother's footsteps. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my and, God. and then it keeps coming up and it gets more and more sinister. And and as a horror fan, I can already see how they would use that, you know, as a thing. And I, I, I'm automatically reminded of, um, you know, the conjuring clap. Did you ever see that? Yes. You know, where they do yeah, the clap yeah, thing. Yeah. And it's just like, my, my friend Mark, uh, who, you know, uh, Kat, like, said the, the only supernatural experience he ever had was where someone was, like, knocking on the other, on the side of his bedroom wall. But his bedroom wall um overlook the staircase so there was no way oh, someone no. could be there so he says in movies when there's anything like that and he's seen the orphanage so yeah i remember him telling me about that and yeah. also yeah the clap in the conjuring as well he just said it's just too much you want to try and freaky. freak some people out just add kids games and just turn them yeah. sinister and that mask oh my as god well. yeah that mask is fucking oh crazy. yeah that oh, mask Thomas. holy yeah. shit yeah. That, like well, that. that'll be in your <clears throat> dreams forever that's and so iconic even i know that i've not seen the movie but he's got like a snorting mask. thing he's got like difficulty breathing so you can just yeah. Oh, I like need to watch this it. film. Oh, it's so good. I've got it on, on DVD. I love you. And oh, it's please, uh, yeah. like it just uses dramatic irony so well to create suspense. And there's there's maybe a couple of kind of jump scares, but just that entire film is so beautifully done. It's so so good. I love that film. Um, that was directed by J. A. Bayona before he did like Jurassic World, <clears throat> Jurassic World: Fallen Kingdom, or oh, yeah. Uh, that's, yeah, that's why right. people were so excited about uh, Fallen Kingdom, and then it turned out to be well, yeah, yeah, you know, like how it's kind of set, like the the second half in the creepy house, and like the yeah, the yeah. Indo Raptors, like and it's literally like Nosferatu stuff. references with like this sort of um, you know the shadow on the wall and everything. Exactly, it's yeah. like it just for me just didn't fit the Jurassic Park thing you know it just wasn't i mean maybe one scene in a house would have been good but to set the entire second or th- second and third act in the house was just like i love how we haven't mentioned pan's labyrinth at all I know. <laughs> anyway yeah. now here here i, I can bring Del-Toro. it back Del-Toro. so cool, so cool. the orphanage is is a film that that has an ending where it's this kind of like is this is this a fantasy in her imagination because she's ill and um, and you kind of have these hints throughout that that she might be dying of something, 
and uh, or is this what's actually happening? And I think with with Pan's Labyrinth, that's kind of the the biggest question that that's left pretty open ended, and I'm I'm sure we'll talk about it at length. Is in this um, you know civil war, Spanish civil war era situation where this little girl's life is getting drastically and drastically more awful. Um, you know, is this escapist and this um, girl's imagination who reads a lot of fairy tales um, or is this actually happening? That is the biggest sort of poser, isn't it? And like rewatching it. I think it's that's what I love so much about it is there's certain movies for me, things like Donnie Darko springs to mind uh, where I, I pretty much form a different opinion every time I watch it. <laughs> yeah. So therefore, mm. it has so much rewatch value. Because uh, last night, so spoilers, spoilers ahead, spoiler warning for everyone. But, you know, for example, when the commandant sees her, sees her speaking to the fawn at the end and the fawn isn't there. Yeah. So I thought, yeah. right, first of all, so I was convinced it was all in her head. But then I realized that the, uh, you know, that the captain had taken uh, a drug just before he came out, which could cause hallucinations for him not to see the fawn. So, you know, it. it I was kind of less sure yesterday what it actually means and what you know the actual you know outcome There's was. Definite ambiguity all the way through. So much and, ambiguity. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and I I picked up on that moment too because I was as I was watching it and I was I was trying to kind of collect evidence of of which side I, I was on this time. Um, it was that moment where I was like, that's really the only sort of quote unquote evidence that can point to it not being real. Yeah. Um, you know, and it could also be that because she is non-mortal, that she is this princess, that she's able to see the fawn and um, mere mortals yes. that are occurred not to me as well. To. It's like you, you, you are not allowed. There's so many um, sort of like fairy tale tropes where it's like you have to either believe in something to see it, or if it doesn't want to be seen by you, it's like Hellraiser. You know, in Hellraiser, the Cenobites can't be seen by people who don't want to see them. That kind of thing. So. You know, it really is kind of open. Plus, it keeps saying that you have to look at the book when you're alone, and then the mm. pages will fill. You have to use the chalk when you're alone, and then things will happen. So maybe the fact that because she was only supposed to be alone, as soon as he came around the corner, then like, yeah, he disappears. Or you know, oh yeah, I mean that's that's totally that's totally possible. And there's also this idea of innocence that that goes on throughout it, and um, and you know. Being being innocent maybe also helps. You know, there's uh, like in, in in Harry Potter being able to see the the horses who draw the carriages. It's like if you've seen someone die, then you're able to to see the horses. And if if you haven't, if you have that sort of innocence of not being touched with death in your life, then then you're unable to to see it. It's like a massive um, metaphor for like desensitization and like you know things yeah. as you get older, like seeing these. Uh, horrendous things and uh, the they had uh, speaking of horrendous things uh, uh, it has probably you know when people talk about cgi not being like you know a, a good thing to use to overuse in movies i think it has its most subtle use in in cinema history in this which is where the uh is it vidal or captain vidal, captain yeah. vidal or whatever vidal. yeah uh, gets the peasant man and he smashes his nose into his oh face God, yeah that is with a, a wine bottle scene and i was like yep. that is the best prosthetic effect i've ever seen and then it turns out uh, you know in the making of he's got like a green patch mm. over his nose and the guy you know proceeds to smash him with like you know i assume is like a you know, a, a rubber bottle or what have you, yeah. and his nose disappears into his skull. And and I remember just thinking, you know, for people who you know condemn CGI outright, I'm like, those are the best uses Effective of it. Effective uses, yeah. Yeah, there was no way in hell I thought that was a CGI effect. You know, no, when I saw and, it and it works. And perfectly. there's certain aspects now that that don't quite hold up. Um, you know, some CGI that's very clearly CGI, but the butterflies, so for much, example, you know, the, the, yeah, the fairies. I mean, sorry, yeah. Yeah, and there's there's a couple of moments with the the large toad where you can tell that they yeah. they've gone CGI rather than practical. That was a little bit obvious, but some of it, some of the effects are just absolutely beautiful. And I think so much of the animatronics and practical effects oh, that they yeah. did were a very very good call because yeah. those those hold up better than you know older CGI. The the, the, the pale man scene is is my, oh my God. the most disturbing moment. The pale the me. pale man the fo- just the fawn's creature design as well. I absolutely adore. The I, I love the danger of, and the danger of the fawn. Like you never really know what he's about. You know you no. don't know whether he's trying yeah. to yeah. deliberately mislead her or you know if he he's actually does very, need her assistance or it's it's wonderful. He's very 
ambivalent. There's a bunch of red flags around him, but it, Definitely. yeah, it's, it's, he's, he's such an interesting character in that way. And I have so much to say about the, the pale man as well. I wanted to jump back though, just for a second to, um, that idea of being able to, to see the fawn or not for, um, Vidal in the end. And I just remembered that Mercedes tells, um, it's so it's so weird to see Mercedes since it just sounds like a car, but I don't want to say Mercedes because it's <laughs> or a stripper name or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah, it's, exactly. It can't quite, there's certain Porsche, Spanish words one should try and pronounce, yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but she she is talking to Ophelia, who tells her, um, you know, that she's seen fairies and like, have you ever seen fairies? And she said, Oh, I did when I was young. Yeah, you, uh, you know, which which kind of implies that, you know, when when you're young, you're able to to see the things in this this fantasy world that you're able to kind of cross over. There into you go. It. So the captain's too old and too uh, too. Um, what's the word? Too backwards. Jaded. Uh, too jaded. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. What word. <laughs> I, I would say that the Captain Beatle might be the most evil character in Completely. anything I've ever seen. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, He's the proto-fascist. <laughs> He's certainly in the top three, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> maybe like, Hitler in Hitler in downfall at number one, <laughs> and then I go from there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's deeply unsettling in every scene that that he's in, and um, that actor was actually um, a comedic actor, and um, apparently, especially in in Spain, and um, Del Toro was was told by another Spanish director, it was like you can't have him like play that that kind of role. The Spaniards will never believe it. You know he can't he can't play you know mean. And Del Toro was like, watch me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's masterful direction, masterful acting from him, and just the fact that like he he is so just strict and so bland he he smiles maybe yeah. once or, or something during, when like he's yeah. told good news from the doctor but apart apparently from that, he was told nothing. to like bring his voice down an octave and to keep yeah. everything very level which made him so much scarier like yeah he mm. does yell on a couple of occasions yeah. but how much scarier is it when somebody gets quiet you know, and oh, when they have a non-reaction is is terrifying. Like you know, there's mm -hmm. there's a scene in There Will Be Blood where Daniel Plainview they're at a whorehouse and Daniel Plainview is just sitting there in the corner. You know, he's not he's not interested in like he has no emotional reaction. He has no interest in sex whatsoever or buying it. He's just sat there, and that's way more terrifying than someone who's being way more terrifying. Yeah, you know, being jaded and being seedy and whatever. It's just like it, it's just that someone having a non-reaction or like no no emotion is like way more terrifying it, it did kind of strike me that um we had this vidal character in pan's labyrinth and then a year later we had anton sugar from no country for old men and i saw mm. lots of similarities in just in terms of how plain they are but how terrifying they are in their plainness mm. and their um yeah just how they could be completely normal at one part and then just absolutely just bashing someone's face in, in the next part or strangling them in anton sugar's yes. case mm -hmm. and yeah, just really well done and just terrifying how they came in such quick succession. Yeah, I think maybe the key to a really evil character is designing someone that you can't imagine smiling at a puppy, you know? There you yes, there that's you a go. good you one. Can't, yeah. You can't imagine joy filling his eyes. Mm. Yeah, um, just, just disinterest or disgust, you know? Like, yeah. That would be great. You know, this film really reminds me of anime and... Uh, Matt, you were saying Mike's a fan of, of anime. Um, so I was like, oh, I totally have a way to bring this up and make it feel relevant. Oh, please, very interesting. Um, I, I just think that, I mean, I, I was reading that apparently they had to put a bunch of warnings up in on Spanish theaters because um, families were taking their kids to see this because they're like, oh, it's a fantasy movie about a kid. That means it's for kids, no. um, which is a grave error. Yes. I mean, I've seen this film now several times. I know what happens and there are still scenes I kind of want to fast forward through because they they make me squirm. Yeah. And so. yeah. And I just think that anime is is the um, the thing that tends the most to do something as dark and violent and gritty and also involving fantasy and also involving sort of young characters at, at the center. Um, and it does a lot of that question of, um, is this real or is this in somebody's imagination? Um, it, it, it kind of reminds me of like, uh, like Satoshi Kon, um, who's a, a anime movie director who does a lot of that like, oh, we're going to blur the lines between reality and and not reality. Um, 
But apparently the idea for this started out with um, Del Toro having apparently like a recurring dream about a fawn appearing from behind his, his grandfather's clock. And he started coming up with ideas for it in like 1993. Um, and of course, this film didn't come out until 2006. But some of his initial thoughts about it were to have a woman falling in love with the fawn, which makes me think that he decided to save that for Shape of Water. Shape of Water, yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, yeah. And and I'm really glad that he did the the child thing because it's so much more interesting. I think uh, with with thinking about the way children think about the world and how they're they're still kind of developing ideas about it, so they're much more susceptible to fantasy, much more susceptible to. Um, you know, falling into these these traps or doing something that that somebody wants, and you don't kind of go, "Oh, you idiot!" You know, you're like, "Oh, they're a kid." You know. Yeah. I mean, you say that. I still scream at, at the TV every time she <laughs> takes those grapes from the pale man. Oh my oh, god! That's like, yeah, you that's had the one, one thing. job. <laughs> and she's told so many fucking times. Yeah. Yeah. Can we talk about that? It's. Well, one thing I didn't really pick up on before was just the kind of the theme that runs all the way through of disobedience that I didn't really pick up on before. Yeah. And like the, the fawn says, why must you disobey when he learns of the grapes? And Captain Vidal says it's the same to uh, the doctor, the doctor, the doctor when, yeah, when, yeah, when yeah, he yes. gives the morphine. The word to, obey and obedience comes up so much. Exactly. And I hadn't really picked up on that And they got the rebels, the, um, the Spanish rebels literally disobeying the, the government <laughs> yeah. in the worst way possible. So Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's very true. And, and the doctor makes such a good point um, of, of saying, you know, what's what's the point of uh, obedience without without thinking or questioning, you exactly, know? Yeah. And <clears throat> and then you know, even the the fawn says to Ophelia, like, no more questions, like, yeah. <laughs> this time, no more questioning. Me, yeah. Big red flag yeah. from him. But the, the, yeah, that's what I really liked as well <laughs> is the fact that like she usually in um, like Western kind of films like this, there would be like, oh, you're safe in the fantasy. And like, mm. that's your, that's your reprieve from the, the horrors of normal life. But then yeah. even then, like she's still threatened by the toad. She's still threatened by the pale man. Mm. And, you know, she has to kill her brother by the fawn's request if, if, if that's the case. So it's like, it's more dangerous seemingly in the fairy tale world. And like danger is around every corner. And her dad like is, uh, you know, the fascist, sorry, the step, stepdad, right? The um, stepfather. Yeah. yeah. Is, is basically saying, you know, obey, obey, obey. And you, you know, you will be subservient. And the fauna is saying, the fawn is saying you, obey, you know do this and you will have everything you know you will mm, have power yeah. and you will be a princess like you will rule this kingdom mm. again so it's like it's interesting that they're both sort of offering the completely different outcomes but they're both basically saying you know you have to obey these these rules so, uh, yeah i mean the, and that's that's an absolutely great point that i hadn't thought much about i'd never thought of the fawn and captain vidal as as sort of parallel characters yeah um but I think that's uh, a great a great point to make, especially when he's the one who stumbles upon her with the fawn. That you know, that's yeah. kind of a moment of her being literally stuck between these these two characters who want her to obey them. Yeah, and and how those those um, can go directly in in contrast. I think that the pale man is also one of the most terrifying creatures of any film I've ever seen. <laughs> no, it's stop. Just, he's he's scary. Giving Stephen me the King. willies. Yeah, He's, he, have you yeah. heard the story of like I, a, the yeah premiere? I read that no 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 go on Del Toro sat next to Stephen King during the premiere oh. and during when the pale man starts chasing after Ophelia he, he like Stephen King was started squirming in his seat oh that I yeah. mean what kind of that's the best accolades you can exactly. possibly get right? Del Toro said that that's my Oscar before he won his Oscar yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's so many things that, that give me that, that frighten me no it, the thing has no eyes for a start it has impossible legs that shouldn't work yeah. and it comes round a corner <laughs> you know, things, I know that sounds really weird, but things coming around the corner at a distance <laughs> All three. freak the fuck out of me. I don't know why. It could be something to do with American Wealth in London and the tube scene. I don't know. Yeah, but the, the, the idea of something, you know, encroaching on you. I think it goes back to being a kid, you know, people chasing you up the stairs, like, you know, as yeah. kids and feeling that mm -hmm. kind of, you know, presence behind you. Uh, yeah, well, that's that a very primal thing, isn't it? Mm. I think that also, you know, I, I read that apparently um, Del Toro had lost some weight and and found the sagging skin disgusting from Ooh. from the weight loss, oh, is and that so why? that's that's why he had the the weird skin on on the, the pale yeah. man. I think you know, yeah, big, I also... big people tend to you lose it from like around your legs, don't you? As well, so it's all kind of hanging there, and like that's mm -hmm. fucked up as well. That you just look down and thought, I, I am a horror monster right now. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, this right? is freaking Bless me him. out. Yeah. Yeah. But, it's, but it's that thing oh. of like the Clive Barker esque thing of body horror as well. 
like things yeah. happening mm-hmm. to your body and stuff. So, I mean, what better source to, to sort of, you know, pull from than your own? I mean, and obviously with the pale man, there's some clear body horror going on. You know, he keeps his eyes on a plate in front of him, <laughs> and oh, yeah. sticks it in his hands when he, when he needs to. Um, but, and I, and I, and I also read that, I mean, it doesn't seem like he's based on the Tenome, which is a yokai from Japanese lore. Um, and Tenome means um, like eyes on hands and looks very similar. So it, it, it could have been something that, that Del Toro had, had seen before. I don't know that it's actually based on it. Um, but those things kind of hang around graveyards. But this Ooh, thing really? has That's a creepy. completely different mythology to it and a fully thought out mythology to it. And that's the thing that struck me the first time I saw this film. And I just I thought about it for so long, just weeks and weeks and weeks. I was thinking about the fucking pale man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's you know, I remember the first time I met you, Kat, you looked like you had a sort of a you know, a look, distant look in a your eyes. A thousand yards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, <laughs> yeah Kat, still Kat, thinking about hello. the pale man. <laughs> yeah, the pale man again. Yeah. But I love the way the pale man if he's to thought of as a literal, this is his, you know, his castle that he's in, his, you know, throne room. He's got pictures of his conquests all around the world of him eating babies and stuff, hasn't he? Like all the yeah, way around the room. And it's, cool they're very that? medieval, the the sort of paintings on the wall. Um, and they remind me a lot of sort of like uh, the medieval bestiaries, um, which is a very, very old um, sort of, quote unquote, encyclopedia of, of beasts. Um, actually really funny read if you can actually, actually find one, there are some transcriptions online. It is hilarious what people used to think of animals at certain times. There's there's things like, you know, if the wolf sees you first, it eats you. If you see the wolf first, you can defeat it. And there's just like all these weird descriptions of things. Wow. Um, So there are people who literally just like lay down in front of a wolf because it saw them first. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. No point. point. (laughs) There's some bad advice in there. And then they also describe a unicorn as a one horned um, four legged beast that runs the plains of Africa. Uh, which uh, I think means that unicorns are actually rhinoceroses. The big and then, old rhino. And then people yeah. just, yeah, and then and then just a game of telephone later, and and they're these beautiful magical <laughs> exactly. creatures that, yeah. Imagine seeing a giraffe for the first time. Like, you know, like, yeah, that'd be kind yeah, exactly. Of weirdly terrifying. Yeah. We've gone off. <laughs> and then topic. you read the description, and you're like, oh, okay, well, I guess that's a thing. It's pr- pretty um, placid, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just eats that nibbling stuff. <laughs> Can, can but you those ask- illustrations just remind me of of the bestiaries and having that pile of shoes. Like, what oh, yeah, a good terrifying. call. Absolutely amazing. So you kind of have this idea that this creature is kind of a boogie monster and, um, you know, just attacks or eats children. And it's fascinating to me that he has this huge spread of, of food in front of him, but he doesn't eat it. You know, mm. it's he, he prefers to, you know, eat children. Um, he has and, only an empty gold plate, doesn't he, in front of him with his eyes on it? Is that all? That's yeah. all he's got, isn't yeah. he? But the the, the um, like you're saying about the best series and like you know like the um, sort of medieval imagery and like you know pulling from those sources, it kind of the film uh, as a whole pulls equally from sort of classical art as it does from mm-hmm. modern art, like you know the Wizard of Oz and things like that. You the know, Ruby the, and the, the Red Shoes, literally, like the Red yeah. Shoes movie as well. So it's kind of like it's saying. I mean, I know Del Toro is a huge film fan. Obviously, that kind of goes without saying. Yeah. But like you know, um, it, it pulls equally from these sources, which make you know, which is a great thing for me because that's saying that you know these films are as much a part of our culture now as the was it called the best series? Did you say, Cat? Yeah. Yeah, we're a part of culture back then, you know, so it's kind of, uh, it's putting everything on an equal footing in that way, which is awesome. Yeah, completely <laughs> agree. Uh, I, I agree with you, Kat, in terms of just the visual of, like, to, like obviously, to scare Matt turning around a corner and just seeing the pale man sat there with this massive feast and he's just still and it's just not moving. And it's oh. like, how long has that been there? Why isn't he yeah. eating? Why? Yeah, but it's curiosity. Just, it's, like, leave it alone for fuck's sake. You know, yeah. like go back to oh, it, but God, you cannot yeah. leave it alone. But like, it's such you know. a good example of show don't tell. Like the pile of shoes, you know what they're from. You you don't need to see them on the wall, but they are on the wall. But it's just masterfully done in terms of this is a dangerous situation. Even though you know all you've had is the fawn just saying, yeah, don't touch the food. That your life may yeah. depend on it. She still does. Oh, still gets me. Um, um, One thing I didn't pick up on as well, another reference is uh, her dress just co- looks like a kind of green Alice in Wonderland. 
costume. Yeah, I noticed like, that this time. That how she kind of goes down a bit of a rabbit hole, toad hole, but whatever. Is she like yeah. carrying a book at one point as well? Like she like literally yeah, the book, a book that the phone gives chest her. and walking along. Yeah. So the, the image, I mean, yeah, it's it's not subtle. <laughs> yeah, but like it being very forest driven and nature based, and how it's like a green version of the the blue Alice in Wonderland. Yes. And everyone picks up on it and I saw the yeah. I, the iconic dress. I was like, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, she's going into the the fantasy world. Yeah. And I never noticed that the split tree that the the large toad lives in is um, in the shape of of the fawn's head. Yeah, neither did I until t- t- uh, watching yeah. it today. Yeah. Holy shit! I don't think I ever noticed that. Yeah, there's, there's, <laughs> there's the loads fuck? of like hidden fawn faces or like uh, yeah imagery yeah. of the fawn everywhere to try and make you feel like you know it's everywhere. Again, rewatch value. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. This time, uh, I also thought a bit more about the idea of being a princess and and some of the fairy tale elements. I mean, of course, you know, it's it wasn't lost on me the first time watching it that three tasks or things that come in threes is a very fairy tale element and was done very purposefully, yeah. you know, that way. But, you know, there's this contrast of her being an actual sort of immortal princess and that sort of flippant, like you look like a princess, that that people say to little girls, and that um, both her mother and Mercedes say to her when yeah. um, she's she's wearing the the little green dress, which of course should remind us of, of Alice in Wonderland, who's kind of an unofficial Disney princess, a non a non princess yeah. Disney princess. If you play yeah. Kingdom um, Hearts, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and Del Toro said that the fantasy world is real um, for him. You know, he made it to be real and he said there's a lot of evidence to show that it is, but he also made the film in a way that should leave it open. Um, so he says, you know, it's it's for the the viewer to decide and it's a discussion point. You know, it's it's meant to be a discussion. And, you know, I was thinking about it and that, you know, later on, once her her mother has died and her stepfather is evil as fuck, and it just kind of seems hopeless for her. Um, you know, Mercedes is left and um, and takes her with her and then she gets caught and then she's in a bad way. And I think at that point, that's when you'd kind of expect the childhood trauma to start taking you into escapist territory. But, you know, when she shows up initially, you know, it's, it's not really, um, you know, she's not super sad yet. It's kind of like she's a little bummed out. She's like, listen, that dude's not my dad. And, and Mercedes is like, all right, you've made that clear. I get it. It's not your dad. Um, you know, so she's not, you know, loving life, but she like loves her mom and, you know, is still looking forward to her brother being born and is kind of enjoying the the countryside and stuff. Um, so it doesn't seem like there's a lot of motivation at the beginning for her to start to see this stuff from, you know, a, an escapist point of view. It's not mm, until the end good point, where... Yeah. You know, so you could almost read the film as, you know, maybe the fawn did leave, um, yeah. you know, that that time when he says you disobeyed me and and maybe that's when it kind of ended for her. And maybe it, he really wasn't there in the end when Captain Vidal, um, you know, confronts her. And maybe at that point she's she's kind of lost it and gone into the escapist thing. So she lost her chance to, <laughs> to be the princess. Yeah. Um, but I think like that's kind of how I read it this time, that it's it's kind of both that initially it is real but the fawn goes away and then she gets into a really bad way and and ends up trying to kind of bring it back in, I, in I, i'm starting to come over to your way of thinking i think my initial on the first few watches when i watched it when it first came out i think i was always thinking that she did she she died and hev- heaven is what you want it to be so you know that she's not really in the magic kingdom but that's her version of heaven so there's still a supernatural thing going on where there is a heaven and she's in it but you know it's not actually a real you know what i mean so that was kind of my reading of it the first few times but yeah maybe I, I, I'm screw you sure. both it's real <laughs> it's real okay yeah. it's real the golden kingdom no she lives <laughs> happily ever after and i hate you both <laughs> you know i one thing i wanted to mention is just like how great this film is for women <laughs> You know, the thing that that bothers me about the way women are are written in films frequently is that um, they either have to take on male qualities in order to be badass or or strong. It's like you you have to be like a dude in order to be respected Um, or it makes them just boring as fuck. Just Mm. just no no personality whatsoever. And um, I think in this this film, you see a lot of of women who have very classically, you know, feminine traits of, of being 
nurturing and um, being maternal, uh, but they do it in such a badass way. Um, and I think that that's done rarely. And when it's done uh, well, it's just, it's really cool to see. And yeah, um, you don't have to avoid uh, feminine traits. You just have to maybe ramp them up to the max. You know, you can be maternal yeah. to the nth degree, basically. And that's, that's awesome. And yeah, still be a badass. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, in that moment when, uh, the fawn tells her that she's made a, a grave mistake and that um, she's cursed to to be among the, the mortals. And um, but yeah, he says that that she's cursed to live among the humans, age like them, die like them and then be forgotten and fade away. And, and I was like, that is such a bleak view of, of humanity. <laughs> yeah. um, and the way he said, it, I was just like, oh, that 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 made me sad. You know, that kind of yeah. like. That. But in that setting, I guess the phone's completely right. Because if you're in that kind of, you know, uh, apocalyptic war setting where everything's fucking going to shit, like, you know, that she, Ophelia would totally believe that as well. Do you know what I mean? If it was set in a really lovely, balanced world. With no uh, hope in sight. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, you could, the phone really, uh, yeah, <laughs> you could certainly get his point across on that one. And it really brought home how awful war is because you realize, oh, she has this chance to to escape and be a princess but then, you know, everything else that, that's going on, it's like, oh, they're all doomed. <laughs> yeah. They're so doomed. And and it, it makes you think about the, the mortal coil a bit bit more. Uh, just bringing up the um, how, how badass Mercedes is all the way through. How she's oh, such God, a... Yeah. I just love that she's given the last line of the captain's life. Of Oh, uh, like, how good is that? We didn't even talk about that. It's such a fantastic last yeah. line. It, like the, the, the rule of three going all the way through it as well. Like he keeps referencing the, the watch, uh, how it's brought up about uh, Videl's father, how he broke it. And that's why you know, you know the context behind it. And then only for it to just be thrown aside and just be, yeah, you, he'll never even know your name. Poof, right oh. in the face it's so cathartic yeah, and it's so beautiful. just yeah punch the air moment and, uh and his room is is supposed to be uh it's supposed to look like the inside of a watch um yeah i did read these that. kind of cogs yeah. and things very interesting and to watch back now if i if yeah. i was to watch it again no problem it's his hobby isn't it control of time yeah he's That's very meticulous yeah and, yeah and that that moment of like clutching the the watch and he knows it's the end and this and it's it's going against what that the fawn is saying that you know he's trying to live on and not be forgotten. You know he wants this legacy. You know having the son is more important to him than than his wife surviving the son's birth. And he makes that you know evidently clear. Um, and he has this last moment where he's like, okay, well it is my time to die, but I want to be able to live on. So tell my son these things about me and just her just going denied. Nope. <laughs> You don't get that. And you don't get that so decision. It's so fucking great. It's <laughs> yeah, so brilliant. good. We're done taking your orders. We're not going to listen to you anymore. We're not going to give you any kind of airtime, anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Just how all Antifa should be. And there's, be. yeah, <laughs> and there's no like, you know, mustache twirling speech about it at all. All it is no. is no. Just very plain. And yep. it's just so good. Ugh. Oh so great exactly especially because after you know, like he's just shot ophelia so you want mm -hmm. the ground to just swallow him up and kill him and just have the most awful death possible i was hoping like he did like i don't know have some awful kind of death where a monster would kill him or the fawn would stomp on him but it's just you don't need <laughs> Drop that. him in with the pale man well, yeah <laughs> exactly yeah oh, if he God, just like falls yeah. into the pale man's hole but he is like the pale man oh, ah. what a twist. Ah. Yeah. but no it was just so very cathartic i'll say again just he needs a, he did, he needed a realistic death yeah it's it's probably the most satisfying death of a baddie i think i've ever seen in film yeah because again anton sugar gets away with it spoilers for no country for yeah. but he's able to walk <laughs> right. off and doesn't get any comeuppance whereas this you're actually able to see him get and apparently the the, the shot through the cheek was something that del toro saw himself oh, shit. when when not 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 actually happened but um when he was working uh in a restaurant as a kid um or younger in his life anyway he had to cut he, he used to have his lunch in a graveyard because he's del toro oh, uh, sure. and ghosts are friends uh, as his words are um but he yeah. would have to walk through a morgue to get to the graveyard and he noticed a guy who was shot through the cheek and whose eye had rolled back in his skull like the captain's oh, does man. which is why that it was such a grim detail wound just yeah there. exactly I, yeah so that's why i he did was it. thinking when i when i watched that that i was like that the detail of like the timing of of how his eye fills with blood um and and then rolls back i was like 
that looks like somebody knew something about that. Yeah. You know, but there's there's yeah. no blood that comes from his cheek. And it, it yeah. kind of looks like the way a corpse would have a cleaned wound. Mm. Um, so so that's really interesting. Tom Savini, the, you know, the George Romero's like makeup artist did, you know, like hundreds of films. Uh, he was a Vietnam War photographer. So he oh, photographed Lord. the dead, essentially. So he he, so, that was his education. <laughs> oh, and then God. he went on yeah. to be the makeup artist. So, yeah, he knew, like, that the teeth, you know, exposed on corpses that had been out there and I'm, all these I, horrible details. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But um, <laughs> I, 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 meant, I, meant to say, I meant to say at the beginning as well that, um, you know, when we were talking about the, the, the nose caving in scene, mm. he saw that happen as well. Like oh, really? one of his friends on a night out got oh. a bit larry, got into a fight, and he got punched or hit or something, and then he was a bit dazed. Looked over and saw that happen, Mexico and that's City, obviously, man. yeah, that, that obviously like apparently had such an impact on him that he was like, okay, this is such a gruesome thing. I need to put it in one of my oh, films, and now we all yeah. get to see it now as well. So, and you know, like most most films would just cut away as well. Like most yeah. films wouldn't show you what was going on and certainly wouldn't have it that many times you know it's no. like four or five times yeah. so that's all from cat matt and myself uh so thank you very much for joining us cat uh would you like to plug your pluggables at this moment oh gosh yeah i forgot about that um yeah um i have a podcast that comes out weekly every monday called the anime movie podcast where i talk with my co-host joe welke about um strictly anime movies um, and we're doing Ghibli June this uh, this June. So there's um, a lot of, of Ghibli films that we haven't talked about yet that we are talking about with some special guests. That should be pretty fun. You can find us on Instagram at the Anime Movie Podcast. And uh, you can email at us at uh, the Anime Movie Podcast at gmail.com if you have any suggestions or questions. And it's on Spotify and on um, iTunes. So look out for it every Monday. Fantastic. Um, if you'd like to hear more from our channel as well, uh, please subscribe and be sure to like this video as it really helps with the YouTube algorithm. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch now. We've got our Twitch channel. <gasps> uh, we have indeed. By searching for the name Matt and Mike Full Focus. Uh, say goodbye, Matt. Bye, Matt. Say goodbye, Kat. Bye. Don't. And that's goodbye from me as well. <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye.